I think Salusian spirituality helps us today. We live in a, um, a world that is just permeated by speed, by the internet, by social media. And Francis de Sales obviously didn't live with those kinds of issues, but he certainly had his own things, you know, human nature is human nature. But I think we can learn from his spirituality because it, it tells us to begin every day, like to begin each day with prayer, and, you know, and even just to unpack what prayer means, just to sit still with a cup of coffee in your hand as you begin your day, not to go running off and just recognize that I'm a creature and God is the creator, that the sun has just come up, it's going to set, you know, at the end of the day, and that in this 24 hours or 12 hours before me, who am I going to be? How will I conduct myself? Do I think through the different aspects of the day before me? Like that's what you can do at the beginning. Francis de Sales, his whole spirituality is based on that preparation of the day. Um, and then he talks about this thing. It's, it's very antiquated, but he has this notion of a spiritual bouquet. You know, that at the end of your prayer, you're supposed to, to, to wrap it up in a little bouquet, kind of, so smell those flowers. So during the day, you take that bouquet with you and remember what you prayed for in the morning when you're at a stressful meeting or when your email's just nonstop or when you're stuck in traffic. So it's very practical, very approachable, and very doable. And that's what I love about, you know, Salesian spirituality, the simplicity of it. And back in the day, like a spiritual bouquet, you know, he was thinking, you know, walking along the streets of Annecy, they didn't have the sanitation practices we have. So, you know, maybe you needed that just to get through from point A to point B. So he's, he's taking something that ordinary people would use, um, whether it was smelling salts or whatever, um, and using it in the spiritual life. So people resonated with it. And even today in the 21st century, like when we, when we go through this in the course that I teach, my students are really, uh, they're, they're very surprised by that. They love that image of the spiritual bouquet. And um, it's, it's a good one to remember, especially, you know, as you're trying to slog through, you know, um, a day that's not going the way you want it to. So it's helpful. Salesian spirituality, for me, it's um, inspired common sense. It's um, an early 17th century Spirituality, its genesis, came from St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane de Chantal. Um, it bears the name Salesian after St. Francis, but uh, St. Jane de Chantal is very much a part of that, so it's a shared spirituality. And it really emerged in the Baroque period, uh, where there's a lot of upheaval, a lot of change in society. And I think in our own world today, we have many of those forces at play as there were back in the you know, early 17th century. So it, it really helps us to keep inner peace, um, to keep a heart focus, um, and also to keep uh, balance between our relationships and our work. That, that's really its main contribution. St. Francis de Sales was born in 1567. He was born in Savoy, France. The de in his name, de Sales, refers to the fact that he was born to a noble family. He was the oldest male in the family, which had great significance because he was supposed to follow in the family name and also give greater honor and glory to the de Sales name throughout his lifetime. His early years were dominated by his mother, who was very loving and very, very grateful to God for the gift of her son. She doted on him, at least emotionally. But by the time he was ready for school, it was his father who was the great emphasis. His father controlled his education, and he had a tremendous education. He was educated by the Jesuits at the Collège de Clermont, and after that, then he went off to university. And his university studies were in University of Padua in Italy. At that time, it was one of the most prestigious but also progressive universities in Western Europe. He left Padua with doctoral degrees in both canon and civil law. But during his studies, he also had one of the great crises in his life. When he was studying the works of John Calvin, 
he came upon Calvin's definition and theory of predestination. And for whatever reason, Francis was more and more convinced that he might be among those who were predestined to hell. He fell into a deeper depression, did not eat, and many were fearing that he might not live. But he did come out of this depression, and as he came out of it, he came with a conviction in his life. And the conviction that he came to was, even if he could not love God in the next world, he could dedicate himself, devote all of his time and his energy to loving God in this life. A countercultural view of love, that we don't love to be rewarded, we lo love because it's at the core and it's at the heart of who we are as people. After his graduation and his degrees from university, it was time for him, as part of the noble class, to go back because his father had already arranged for a bride for him and had already received for him a very prestigious post as provost in his area. Francis had a little bit of a problem because that's not what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be a priest and it took a lot of conjoling and some help from his friends for his father to finally be convinced that Francis could be ordained a priest, and he was in 1588. And he volunteered right away for a pretty difficult mission, and that was to go to the home missions in France in the region called the Chablais. And the Chablais, after the Protestant Reformation, had become Calvinist. So Francis and his cousin went into the Chablais to try to make, invite, encourage the Calvinists to come back to the Catholic Church. They were not well received. People did not want to listen to them. They heckled them. They made fun of them. They walked away from them. It was hard for them to celebrate the sacraments. And then finally, Francis decided what he would do is he would change his tactic and he would start writing. And he wrote pamphlets about Christ's great love for us on the cross. He wrote pamphlets about the centrality of love in the Christian life. And little by little, he began to persuade many in that area to come over to Catholicism. It was very different because at that time, most of the preaching and most of the missionary activity was through fear and force, condemning people if they would not come over to a particular religion. Francis did not like that. He said nothing through fear, nothing through force, all through love. Once again, love proves to be the central message and the central point of Francis's life. Francis in 1602 became the Bishop of Geneva. When he went to Geneva, he could not go into the city because it was a closed city. It was a Calvinist city. So he ended up living in Annecy, France. He spent much time in his diocese, going around to the parishes, preaching, teaching. He did catechism for the children. He did great big retreats. He did big masses, but he also did one-on-one -on -one a lot. And when he came home, he also had a servant named Martin who was a deaf man. He saw it as part of his role as bishop of the diocese to do catechism and to teach the faith to Martin. So he developed a sign language that he and Martin could communicate with. Once again, for Francis, it's not always the big things, but there's nothing small in the service of God. And his love for Martin showed forth. He would be an arbitrator. He would be a mediator. He would interpret the law. And people would line up outside his office the beginning of the morning, and they would go all day pleading their cases before him. The custom was to have those of high rank go first and the lower ranks after. The big problem, though, was those of the lowest rank oftentimes did not get a chance to see him because the day would end before they had their chance. Francis learned about this, and then he went against the culture by going to the back of the line and starting with those in the back first, much to the chagrin and the dismay and displeasure of those of higher rank. He was one who looked at the ordinary things in life, the ordinary people, the ordinary moments. And he said, when we bring great love to these ordinary moments, then they become extraordinary. 
So love makes things extraordinary. Francis was known for his friendships, especially his spiritual friendships. One of his favorite things to do was spiritual direction, and most of it was by letters. And he wrote hundreds and thousands of letters to people who were seeking his advice and his counsel on how they could live a more full and spiritual life. The person most noted in this time of his life is his good friend, St. Jane de Chantal. And isn't it funny how saints become friends of other saints? Famous people become friends of other famous people. Rich people become friends of rich people. And then there's the rest of us, and we just become friends with the, the rest of us. But this friendship with Jane uh, blossomed in many ways. But one of the things that happened in spiritual direction with Francis and Jane is Jane would bear her soul to Francis. And she would share with him her insecurities, her anxieties, her fears. And Francis would say to her in one letter, Jane, if only you could see yourself as God does, simply through the eyes of love. And that's what Francis tries to teach each of us. God looks at us through the eyes of love. Let's accept that love and share that love. In addition to being a good friend, um, St. Jane and St. Francis also were the founders of a religious community, the Visitation Sisters. It was to be a brand new community within the church. The sisters were supposed to leave cloister and go work with the poor. They were supposed to take one vow, just the vow of charity, the vow of love, instead of the three traditional vows. And Rome would not allow that. So Francis put in their spiritual directory, their rule of life, that we have no bond but the bond of love. And that love that the sisters showed was to be a, a love of martyrdom, that every day that they were supposed to uh, put down their own self-will to live together in joyful love and service to others. Francis also is known as a great author. There are over 26 volumes of his works. Most of those are letters of spiritual direction, and those are only the ones that have been saved. He also is famous for one of the great spiritual classics, The Introduction to the Devout Life, which was written in 1609. And even the, the title of the book speaks to Francis and the hallmark of love. The word devotion for Francis means love on fire, that our love is meant to be uh, passionate. It's meant to be infectious, that other people want to be a part of that. In his writings, he also liked to make sure that people knew the power of words and that words could change lives. And so he has many little maxims. And here are just three. Be patient with all, but above all yourself. The measure of our love is to love without measure. And be who you are, but be that perfectly well to the glory of God, who is the great creator, and you are his creation. In Francis's life, love was the hallmark. Love was the center of all who he is. But even in death, once again, the primacy of love is what Francis de Sales stood for. It's what he lived for. It was at the core of who he is. And it's at the core of Salesian spirituality. So all of us who follow the Salesian tradition are also called to make love the core and the center of who we are and the virtue which defines us. Primarily, Francis de Sales was a writer. He's the patron of writers. And, you know, he put down into words what he was thinking. And both the introduction to the devout life, the treatise on the love of God. Um, they say that every evening when he was done work, he would write letters to, to varying people. So he was prolific. And, you know, his, at least his, his two books and, and some other of his texts, they're, they're classics, you know, like they stand the test of time and that we're able, you know, to, to go back to his text and apply it to today like we would do any text. So whether it's Shakespeare or whether it's scripture, um, that we're able to do that. And in, in, in that inspired common sense that he gave us, we can see that, you know, that even though we think we're so advanced in the 21st century, um, we're still human. And I like to think that during this pandemic, this little microbe that has pulverized human dreams um, and, and continues to do that, that in 21st century, we can't solve that. And 
Even Francis de Sales lived under the shadow of the bubonic plague. You know, his own brother died of the plague in an army camp in 1616. So, you know, he knew it. And so they were dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with today. So, so his words of, of hope and peace and patience still live on for us today. You know, we, we got started in France, and, and maybe in terms of the Oblates, again, Salesian spirituality is much bigger than us. Salesians of Don Bosco, missionaries of St. Francis de Sales, uh, Sisters of Our Lady Help of Christians. Uh, that's just to name a few. I, I was looking through a book earlier today. There are probably at least 15 or 20 canonically recognized religious groups, large and small, that are devoted to uh, the vision of Francis de Sales. Salesians of Don Bosco, hands down, are the largest member of that family. We exist for one reason and one reason only. And we do it in a lot of different ways. Schools, parishes, military chaplain, fire chaplain, whatever, campus minister. But our, our stock in trade is the vision and the message and the insight uh, and the inspired common sense of Francis de Sales. That's it. I'm so proud to be an oblate of St. Francis de Sales, and we are one microcosm of the, of the worldwide Salesian family. So we have the um, Sisters of the Visitation, founded by St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane in 1610, and there's monasteries around the world. Uh, there are the Salesians of Don Bosco, um, oblates of St. Francis de Sales, oblates Sisters of St. Francis de Sales. There's the Missionary Society of St. Francis de Sales. There's the lay, the lay Associates, the Daughters of St. Francis. There's so many groups. If we put them all together, uh, we are a real force to be reckoned with. And I think sometimes we forget that. So it's, it's a delight, really, to know that there are so many people in our world today who are practicing Salesian spirituality. And there's a, a book by Charles Keating. It's called Who We Are is How We Pray. And he identifies like four major spiritualities that people in, in America kind of live their life by. So Franciscan spirituality, Ignatian, I think Theresian, Carmelite spirituality, and then Salesian. And that, um, you know, that there are different ways that people think about God and practice their spirituality, but, and, and, and many good ways. But Salesian way really helps us to recognize the humble, gentle Jesus and to organize our lives around the teachings of Jane and Francis, which are about common sense, living in the present moment, you know, practicing the direction of intention, um, and living Jesus, and in all of our actions. So I think um, it's nice to be part of that world community. Well, you know, I think as, as, each, as many religious communities are older and smaller than they used to be, it's uh, one of the upsides is we've, we've kind of gotten to know some of our cousins in the Salesian tradition. Uh, we've known about the Francalians, the missionaries of Francis de Sales in India for a long time. Um, but I don't think till recently did we realize that we, you know, we really do have a, a relationship or, or overlap with the Salesians of Don Bosco. When our founder was looking uh, to establish a rule for us, he had a sit down with, Don, with John Bosco. Uh, they spent a couple days together. Um, Vincent de Paul, Vincentians, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't start the Vincentians, but Francis de Sales and Vincent de Paul were very good friends. In fact, so much so that when Francis de Sales died, Vincent de Paul became Jane de Chanel's spiritual director and was sort of a supervisor of a visitation. So there's, there's these, all these, you know, in the Salesian world, it's a Venn diagram. And there's all these different, unique, standalone circles, but they all overlap each other. Uh, we, in the United States, we've, we've established a, a, the North American Salesian Network. Uh, groups of religious, lay, secular, uh, just in, in, in North America who are trying to do more with, with less, uh, trying to make a bigger splash and, and, and uh, expose more people to Salesian spirituality in ways that are very different. You know, we're not, we're not all standalone anymore. You know, we're, we, we, we really, if there's, if there's an upside to being older and fewer, it's that it really has inspired us and driven us to, to discover our cousins, to discover all these other groups, both lay and, and religious and secular, who have always been there, but kind of hidden in plain sight. And now we're, you know, we're all kind of distant relatives and we're getting to know each other. We're not just getting to know each other, we're working together. For Francis de Sales, when he wrote the introduction to The Devout Life, uh, he said to Philothea, that's who he addressed it to, so it means lover of God, um, he says, inscribe the name of Jesus on your heart. 
And even St. Jane de Chantel took him seriously, like literally, and she, she tried to do that. So I'm not recommending that. But he's saying to inscribe the holy name of Jesus on our hearts and to live Jesus, which I learned one time was more a rallying cry, more a motto, more like you find yourself at a sporting event. And you say, live Jesus. You know, that's what it's supposed to be. It's not some sedentary, holier-than-thou way to clothe ourselves in virtue. But, it, you know, Francis Sales, every letter he wrote, he would put VJ on the top, so in French, vive Jésus. And so he meant that. He wanted us to just be aware that we live in the holy presence of God and that Jesus, who lived and breathed and walked on this earth, who dealt with all the things we're dealing with as a human being, that um, we, we should try to live like him. You know, so he was someone who was a person who taught to love God with our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors ourselves, like that double commandment. And that's it. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. So Francis understood that, and so by living Jesus, we apply that same principle today. And to love one another the way we're loved, and to be sister and brother to one another. And that kind of spirituality might sound simple, but there is a wealth of wisdom and knowledge in that little phrase, live Jesus, that needs to be unpacked by all of us in our own unique way. And however we do it, by letting our light shine, um, that's, that's what it means to be a disciple of Francis and Jane.